Good afternoon and good evening to everyone listening. Welcome to Inside the Office of Regulatory Affairs, seven years of regulatory reform in Nova Scotia. My name is Matthew Campbell, and I'm the past chair of IPAC Nova Scotia. And by day, I'm Deloitte's public sector Atlantic leader in climate change and sustainability, as well as regulatory modernization. And on behalf of my colleagues at the Institute of Public Administration of Canada, I'm very pleased to welcome you all here for what will be, no doubt, an engaging discussion on the regulatory landscape in Nova Scotia. And so over the next 57 minutes, we're going to be exploring the origins of Nova Scotia's Office of Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness, how they found their footing, what they've achieved over the past seven years, what they've learned along the way, and maybe a little bit about what the future of regulation might look like in the province. This is, of course, part of a series of events we've put together focused on the key issues in government and public administration. Each is designed to bring together thoughtful, inspiring thinking from public sector leaders and practitioners, and today is certainly no exception. We'll be taking your questions throughout the event. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask Laurel or Leanne, um, you can enter it through the chat on YouTube throughout the hour. And then kind of toward the end of the discussion, we'll reserve some time to bring in uh, audience questions. And so finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Laurel Broughton is the CEO of Nova Scotia Business Inc., otherwise known as NSBI. She's a former lawyer, a cabinet minister, and the author of the 2014 report, Charting a Path for Growth. How often do we include that in your, uh, your opening <laughs> bio, Laurel? Um, and that report actually first recommended the creation of a central unit to work across government and drive regulatory modernization in the province. And just last week, Laurel was, no Laurel was named one of Atlantic Canada's top 50 CEOs, I think for the third time. So congratulations and uh, welcome Laurel. Thank you. So I think that, I, I know it seems exciting and soothing, but I'm certainly still hearing the music in the background. So I don't know if others are hearing uh, our, our music in the background. So uh, maybe we, we don't want that. Uh, let me just simply say how happy I am to be here um, and to talk about uh, regulation and to talk with Leanne, because uh, one of the things you're always excited about as somebody who gets to create a plan um and you know think about how we could solve a problem um is that you're very appreciative of the people that take up that and do it um from my own background that was probably one of the biggest changes when i moved from government to being a consultant in my early consulting initiatives i realized quite clearly they didn't have to do what i suggested that they do and that was very frustrating to me um so for some of you that are on the consultancy side we feel it we understand that that's what happens uh you want to have people like leanne hashi and the team at office of Re regulatory affairs and effectiveness to take up that mantle uh so let me dig in and give a, just a bit of background about how uh, the report came to be um, and then where we go from there. So obviously I had moved to Nova Scotia uh, as a an outgoing cabinet minister and I was reached out to with respect to the willingness and openness to tackle charting a path for growth. Um, and then the conversation became a, a dual conversation that we needed to tackle the issues of both taxation and regulatory affairs um, and regulation. And on the regulation piece, I know that that, you know, maybe uh, not for this group, I think today, but for many people, regulation and your eyes glaze over. What does regulation have to do with anything? But certainly I had been a regulator. I had been the minister of environment. I had been a cabinet minister around a table where we wanted to bring in strong regulation, whether it was about water protection, climate change, um, air pollution. But we also knew in dusting off some old regs that things had not been touched for years and years and years. And so it was something that I really felt did um, create an uh, impediment to growth. Um, so I started digging into the new regulations in this jurisdiction on new regulations in this jurisdiction and really trying to figure out how could we tackle these things. What became very clear early on was that 
There was no way that this was going to be done without an office in place that had the highest uh, authority and leadership uh, of the premier, of a very senior minister to be able to tackle these things. And that I really tried to lay out an entire plan as to how it could be done almost as if I was going to be able to do it, but I knew I was really creating a roadmap for somebody else, a, you know, charting that course, do this first, do this second. Um, and so I couldn't have been more pleased when uh, Leanne and Fred Crooks and that team was uh, put in place and created to be able to do the work. So I'm going to kick it off and introduce uh, Leanne. She's the executive director of regulatory reform and partnerships in the Office of Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness. She's held a number of senior roles in government and business, including a VP of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, who I will give a shout out to, are really one of the first organizations to start talking about the economic negative of economic impact of regulation. And they were somebody that really started the conversation about measuring that impact. And so I will get into the conversation, Leanne, and we'll talk about all those things. But, you know, why don't I kick it over to you and say, you come into this new office, hopefully you uh, are given a roadmap. Um, and then what do you guys do next? Because <laughs> I think we're going to be able to talk about a, an amazing journey that you've done and impact that you've had over the past seven years. Well, thank you so much, Laurel, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak to folks today. Um, there isn't a person probably you'll find that's more excited to talk about regulation or regulatory reform or regulatory excellence. My husband hates taking me to cocktail parties because, in fact, that's really all I want to talk about. So to have a captive audience here is my dream come true. So thank you. And also thank you uh, to you, Laurel, for charting that course. I can tell you I was in another organization at the time when your report came out and at CFIB, as you had mentioned, um, we were very big on regulatory reform. We were big on regulatory reform because every time we sat in the office of one of our members who were small businesses, we heard about two or three things, taxation, regulation, and usually the shortage of, uh, of labor. Um, Taxation and the shortage of labor always got a lot of attention, but regulation hardly did. So when your report came out, the fact that it was put on the same level as that other primary policy instrument of government was music to my ears. So thank you so much for giving it the credit it deserves and unearthing the opportunity that it has too. So back to when we started. We came in, four of us um, at the time in 2015, and all we had was a mandate, which was uh, to improve the regulatory environment in Nova Scotia. We came into an empty office with no computers, with a, a, a fridge full of beer that was left by the, the previous tenants, and we had to decide how the heck do we take this incredibly expansive mandate and do something with it? because there was just four of us, and right now Laurel, there was only 15 of us, we really had to pick our spots. We knew that we couldn't boil the ocean. We knew um, that in order to prove uh, the value that your report outlined regulation could do, we had to focus in a few areas. So one, we started working on some legislation to help put some parameters around the office, which was critical. And in designing that, that legislation, we intentionally put in a sunset clause because we said, if after three years we haven't proved our worth, we don't deserve to be here. So we put in that sunset clause. We also outlined um, the areas that we wanted to work in. Well, again, the areas uh, were quite broad. We intentionally focused purely on business because of the economic impact that we know improving regulation has on business. Um, and once we had that, we said, okay, well, where do we start? We divided our office into three streams, brought in a few more people. The first stream was assessing and measuring regulation because our legislation require us, requires us to reduce and report on the reduction of regulatory burden. We couldn't report on it unless we knew where we started. So we had to get a baseline of overall regulatory burden and put a plan in place to, re to reduce it. Secondly, our second stream of work is navigation, helping businesses navigate what can be a really complex regulatory environment, not just at the provincial level, but at all three levels of government, because of course, every government regulates, it's not just the province. And then finally, the partnership aspect. How can we work with other governments, be they 
uh, governments within the region in, in Atlantic Canada, governments across the country, or our municipal uh, partners to align how we regulate so that if you're a business owner, you aren't following one rule in one province or municipality and a different rule in another. So that's essentially where we started. We kind of carved out um, our mandate, or I should say uh, expanded on our mandate in legislation, uh, parsed out how we were going to deliver on that mandate, rolled up our sleeves and started making it happen. I will say, Thankfully, in Nova Scotia, we have an incredible civil service, a uh, public sector leadership and getting uh, having them on board with us as partners in our work was critical because we could not. And I mean, this could not have done it otherwise, because our work is primarily done through the great work of others. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's really why one of my first recommendations was having looked at other jurisdictions who are successful and saying the tone comes from the top. Mm -hmm. because you do need to find the right balance in regulatory reform around we want good, strong regulation, we want to protect people, but we want to find the right balance and we'll need to take some away when they're no longer needed. You just can't put more regulation on top of more regulation. Um, and it's not always top of mind to go in and dust out the cobwebs and take out the trash and take out the old stuff that is not needed anymore. Um, and that would be critical for that kind of balancing. I remember my first conversations in the consultation were really about, you know, risk aversion to say, listen, regulation are about mitigating risk, but we have to find the, the right balance. And so that leadership to say, mm. here's my risk tolerance, here's what I want to do. And also to have some oomph behind what you were doing when you were saying to some listen, we really need to make some changes here. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll say too, what to one of the insights that we've had in our seven years is how keen uh, departments are to be part of a bigger story. So in, um, in the absence of our office, uh, a department may have done some great work to improve a form or uh, improve a process, but it would have been a standalone item. When we have an overall corporate initiative, all of a sudden that standalone item contributes to something much larger. And it tells a fantastic story about how government corporately is moving in the right direction when it comes to improving the regulatory environment. And I'll say um, part of the work of the office uh, during the pandemic was to capture all of the incredible regulatory innovations that departments had done. And again, in the absence of an office to collect them all and wrap our arms around them all, they would have just been standalone items in departments. And what we found in our discussions with departments was how happy and how proud they were to contribute to something bigger. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, and I think the legislative framework is key to stop those stops and starts that you talked about. I think there is good progress that's made, but then it stops and it doesn't become the flavor of the day. We're not going to do that anymore. The legislative framework makes a focus and then the sort of the measuring and the benchmarking and the goal setting as to what we're going to do. I would think that those are really important things that you could use to say, listen, we've got to, we said we'd make a certain target. We need to do this. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, regulation or regulatory reform is very incremental. It is improving a form here, improving a process there, removing a regulation here. Um, and again, as standalone items, it's really hard to get momentum behind them. Um, however, when it is part of a larger picture, when you are setting a burden reduction uh, target, which we did, again, with support of our incredible partners of $25 million net, all of a sudden that one initiative adds up with the 25 others uh, that were implemented to really knock the ball out of the park when it comes to what we can achieve when we work together um, and taking those individual initiatives and again, bundling them together so that they're part of a larger story. I think that is the benefit of having a corporate focus on this. And again, as you say, Laurel, measuring is key. Um, it's very hard to describe what burden reduction looks like when you're when you're not talking in dollars or time we were able to create a tool uh, many of our department uh, partners complete this tool called the business impact assessment which is based on a globally recognized methodology called the standard cost methodology 
that helps quantify the impact of individual regulatory changes. So all of a sudden, um, a initiative that would have before been described in words, such as we've moved a process online, you can describe in numbers, we moved a process online and by doing so, we've saved the industry a million dollars, $25,000, what have you. So all of a sudden you're starting to articulate what regulatory reform looks like uh, in a more concrete and practical way. And I think, again, that's the power of having a corporate focus on this work, but also having uh, uh, partners in departments that really can get behind the need to quantify uh, the impact of the changes that, that they're driving. Yeah, let's stay pre-pandemic for a moment and talk about um, sort of, I have two questions for you. Proudest moment. What is the thing that you're like, wow, I'm so proud that you and Fred and the team would have said, we are so happy that we got to get that done. I would definitely say um, hitting that first burden reduction target. Um, we uh, pulled the number out of the sky, essentially, because setting a target is really more of an art than a science. Um, we knew what the or an estimate of what the provincial burden was. And we said, OK, well, let's try to get at 10% of it, not even knowing where that 10% would come from. Um, but again, credit and shout out to all players yeah, across government, leaders across government who sat down and said, we can do this, we can do that, we can do that. So incredibly proud, not just for our office, but for all of government. Not only did we meet that target, but we exceeded it. So the initial target was 25 million. And, and I should say net, because we also had a $1 in, $1 out uh, focus. So it wasn't, um, and not every jurisdiction has net targets. Some of them have gross targets. Um, so extremely proud of doing that because once we achieved it, we knew that we could do more. And I think proud too of all of the contributions of departments. Like it wasn't just three or four departments that were contributing to those efforts. It was likely 10 or 12. So really, really proud about that. Yeah, well, you're right. Absolutely right and brave to set a moonshot target where you don't know how you're going to do it. Um, you know, but what I would say to all, you know, those participating and anybody that gets an opportunity to be in, you know, the world where you get to make some of these things happen, you need to do that. Um, and I think strong um, leaders inside and outside of government, when you make uh, and you establish a goal that people believe in and want to accomplish, you always see those things starting to come forward and crystallize. And, um, and you know, most of the time we can make it when we set them up. Sometimes we can't. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we don't do that, we will always, incremental is good, but like we got to leap sometimes and say we want to get here. So, uh, you know, really, really proud about that for you. So another question pre-pandemic. So in the beginning stages of the office, what was the most surprising thing that you encountered when uh, a moment where you all thought, okay, we didn't see that coming? Um, most surprising. So I would say um, it, it's surprising and also one of our continues to be one of our greatest challenges. So when the office was initially created, it was created as an office in Nova Scotia, but also as a joint office with our Atlantic partners. Um, this was uh, very exciting to me because again, in my previous role, um, uh, small business owners would often talk about the need for greater regional collaboration. So I really saw that as an opportunity to advance that goal. What was really surprising to me was how there was a gap between conceptually believing in regional collaboration and how difficult it was to get it done. That came as a real surprise. It probably shouldn't, but it definitely knocked me off my feet because what I thought was going to be a no brainer um, uh, turned out to be incredibly difficult to move incredibly frustrating uh, and very surprising that we haven't had more success than we have. So I would say that is the biggest surprise. It's also the area still uh, one of the greatest opportunities we have in the region if we if we can find a way to um, better align how we regulate. Yes, I would say I wrote quite a bit about regional harmonization and the need to tackle that issue. And I too was quite disheartened by the stories that I was hearing about the differential approaches. Um, and, 
And yet, um, you know, it really is one of those tough nuts to crack, I would say. We're increasingly seeing some success. I know at NSBI, we have the privilege to um, play a leadership role in the Atlantic Trade and Investment Growth Agreement. And it's become a win-win for everybody. There's lots of co-planning. You know, if, if an organization like NSBI innovates a new program and service, we then roll it into that and all of Atlantic Canada from benefit. So I hope that we're starting to see some more, um, you know, understanding of, hey, this can be really good for everybody. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a tough nut to crack. So let's dive into pandemic. And I want to come to the Atlantic bubble in a minute, because I think that that's a good example of what we've been talking about. But I just want to sort of put on in the discussion how different the pandemic was in terms of the machinery of government, right? Government needed to move at lightning speed make changes, do things in a way that was frankly unheard of historically. Also, all the whole globe needed to do that in terms of things like people can't work from home, go and work from home. It's fine. You know, our roads can't be empty and we can't have blue skies. Okay. No one's on the roads and the skies are blue. So global, global changes. But from the regulatory side of things, did you, um, I mean, are there pieces that were incredibly successful because of an openness and a, frankly, a necessity to do things differently. Yeah, so I'll say um, uh, one that the pandemic has really given regulatory reform form a moment because I don't think there has been, at least not in my, my lifetime, uh, such an exercise in regulatory intervention by government. Um, so it really, again, I think brought to the surface this incredibly powerful uh, lever that government has and its ability to use it wisely, to the ability to use it fast and efficiently to the betterment of all. Um, as I mentioned during uh, the pandemic, our office uh, did a few things because what we knew from research was that in the absence of anyone collecting an insights on how um, a health scare like this or a big event like this impacted the regulatory environment, we would quickly lose any lessons learned. So we did do some research after H1N1 to find that any uh, uh, innovations that were put in place to manage that were quickly lost because there was no effort to capture those insights and to put them in place. So we did a few things. We had discussions with departments to learn all of the work that they had done to um, use regulation to uh, protect people, protect uh, health, but also to protect businesses' cash flow um, and really help innovate and enable businesses to innovate how they interacted with customers. So there are, I think there are 130 plus examples of things that departments did, and they did them very quickly. Um, coming to the need to act quickly, we also talked to businesses. So we talked to departments and gathered all of the excellent innovations that had occurred. We talked to businesses and what we, what we heard them say was, it's amazing how this action we had asked for for government for 10 years, all of a sudden was put in place in two weeks. So businesses even acknowledged the speed that government was moving. I would say though, it probably increased their expectation for how quickly government can move because we needed to move very, very quickly. And then the third thing we did, which I think is a real um, uh, um, highlight for Nova Scotia is that we did a jurisdictional scan to see how jurisdictions around the world that are leaders in regulatory reform reacted during the pandemic as well to find out that Nova Scotia did as much if not more than leading jurisdictions. So I'll say again that's not surprising to me because we've been working with um, folks for the past seven years but again it really does underscore how far we've come in Nova Scotia when it comes to regulatory reform and excellence. So, so again, that's another super proud moment for our province. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that what you build over a period of time and what you all built um, over seven years, uh, it was put to the test during COVID-19. I would say that's the same about my organization. What we had built over seven years, we put it to the test then. Um, because of COVID-19, or were we nimble? Were we innovative? Could we do things quickly? Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about the Atlantic bubble uh, because that's a, a great example of 
collaboration and harmonization. And one that, to be frank, you know, I was out on the news talking about because Atlantic Canada was having its moment mm -hmm. um, during the early days of the pandemic that we had collaborated. We were having a summer. Our kids were in school. We were in our offices. And I think we saw some real success from that. So, you know, tell me what your perspective is. And do you think that there's pieces of that that we can keep to drive a more Atlantic harmonization as we yeah. move forward? Um, I think the Atlantic bubble really serves as uh, an example for how much we can accomplish when we work together. So when I saw the Atlantic bubble unfold, it really validated, again, all the research. I know the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council has done at least two significant papers on the material benefits of regional collaboration. And we saw it in life. So for me, it was really exciting to see this um, opportunity come to life. What I had really hoped was that the example of the Atlantic bubble would really encourage us to, con to continue going down this path of regional collaboration. But again, coming back to one of the more surprising things is um, the Atlantic bubble was created out of a sense of urgency. Uh, again, um, uh, you know, addressing the pandemic and the need to have people and, and goods move uh, and not be limited to our very, very small provinces and really our very small region. Um, coming to what would be required for an Atlantic bubble like to occur in other areas, um, I think it would need a burning platform. I don't don't think it needs another pandemic, God help us, but there does need to be some sort of burning platform for the four provinces to get together where there is clearly mutual benefit in working together and there isn't a sense of um, uh, one winning versus another losing. Uh, so again, I just to, to repeat, the Atlantic bubble serves, I think, as an excellent example of the benefits of regional collaboration. And I think if we could find other areas where there is some sort of burning platform and get things done, we would not just be stronger as a region, but we would be stronger as a province. I think you're right. And it's an example of something. And I, I agree with you is it is it will be hard to replicate. Um, and hopefully we don't have another pandemic. <laughs> that being said, I think, again, what was built over time, some collaborative relationships at, um, at at the level of the folks working in regulatory affairs, yourselves, your counterparts, leadership at a political level that said we need to do something together. And I have noticed that since that time, there's a few Atlantic-wide initiatives where folks are calling them Atlantic bubble. And I think they're trying to to, to remind us that it was a proud moment uh, where there was could be collaboration. So absolutely, absolutely. I mean, coming back to just how small a region we are, you know, we're a region the size of the city of Vancouver, uh, a city uh, in essence, that has four provincial governments and all the differences in regulation that entails. Um, in in because we are so small, our businesses are dependent more on interprovincial trade than any other region in the country. Yet it's more costly for our businesses to trade interprovincially because we're so small. Um, the flip side of that is we have way more to gain than anyone else if we are able to reduce barriers. Um, so again, I, I'm making the argument myself, but, but the benefits of regional collaboration are so materially and so significant. And that would be an area that I hope our office uh, can work to advance in the future, because again, it can be a success like the Atlantic bubble. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been talking about working amongst provinces. I want to just kind of go in another direction and talk a little bit about um, municipalities have been key partners in this work. And I know that you have some great examples and um, it would be great to give a shout out to the municipalities that have really put their shoulder to the wheel on trying to tackle regulatory reform. Uh, absolutely. So we have some great partnerships with municipalities, specifically uh, HRM. We've had we've done some work with all of the municipalities in uh, Cape Breton, and we're currently working with some municipalities uh, in the area of building officials. So um, I'll give you an example of one um, work that we did with HRM. So as we can all appreciate as regulators, there are policy areas where there's both a role for the province and for the municipality. 
what you don't want to happen is to have two different policy objectives and the province go off and regulate in this direction while the municipality wants uh, done uh, wants to regulate in a, in a different area. So under our partnership with HRM and again with our partners in uh, the Department of Transportation, we brought together regulators uh, both from the province and from the municipality to sit down and figure out how we want to regulate e-scooters so that when both levels of government went to their uh, leaders with a plan, they were able to say, and we created this in partnership with the other level of government. That, it, that structure hadn't been tried before and it was super successful, so successful in fact that we've been gotten requests from two more areas of policy from HRM to put together what we call regulatory tables. And it's just to make sure everyone's on the same page at the beginning rather than asking for permission or for forgiveness at the end. Yeah, well, and I think that that's ex a great example of being at the beginning. I think that being at the beginning part is where we can really have an impact. I mean, we look at all sorts of new technologies, new areas that we'd like to see develop um, from an economic development perspective in the province. And one of the conversations that we often have is it could be a real um, part of our value proposition if we get out ahead and we create a regulatory structure in the province, not by us, not to be created by, but by the province um, that is um, leading edge, you know, protects our environment, but strengthens our economy. These can be things that we would talk about uh, when we were trying to convince someone to come and set up operations in Nova Scotia. And so I think that that forward looking, thinking about what's coming down and looking perhaps to the mistakes that others have already made that we can learn from. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know another area that we've been working on with municipalities, recognizing that in some cases, municipalities simply don't have the resources or capacity to do this work. Uh, they're too busy making sure the garbage is picked up or the roads are cleared. Um, we uh, had, when we are up in Cape Breton, we had been talking to uh, several business groups who had told us that one of the challenges working on the island is the differences in bylaws between municipalities. So we talked to the municipal leadership in those areas and said, listen, we can help with this if, if you're keen. They said, absolutely. So what we did as an office is on behalf of the five municipalities, hire a lawyer to go through all of their bylaws and identify where the differences exist, what bylaws were outdated or outmoded um, and put action plans for each municipality, which they all signed off on to um, clean up their regulations or clean up their bylaws to remove some of those unnecessary differences. And again, this is work that each of the municipalities said they would always wanted to do, but they simply didn't have, as I say, the resources or the, or the capacity to do it. Something that we were super pleased to help them out with and something that they were pleased with the end product too. Yeah, one of the, uh, the, privileges that I have is I will teach, I teach part-time to law students, students about public policy. And one of the things I often talk to them about is you really probably are underestimating how many of the subject areas or things that you care about are actually governed by regulation. There might be a big piece of legislation out there that gets the flash and, and uh, you know, the attention, but the details, the details are in the regulation. And so if you want changes, you know, you often need to look at that nitty gritty and something like, um, you know, as simple as if four municipalities wanted to procure together some form of service, if their bylaws were all different, how would you do that? Because your expectations of your service provider would be very different and the rules of the game would be different. Yeah, ab absolutely. It really is regulations or they're kind of like the fine print of a contract. It's it's where all the good stuff is. You just have to kind of sort through it. Um, a, a recent example we had, again, with uh, uh, our partners at Municipal Affairs and Housing is recognizing there's a housing crisis going on and recognizing that all of the onus on fixing the problem shouldn't lie with the municipality. There's stuff that the province can do itself. Um, we worked with HRM and with Municipal Affairs to identify a whole bunch of barriers that the province puts up uh, to remove them to expedite the increase in supply of housing. So essentially shorten the time frame, for example, that uh, planning documents sit with the Department of Municipal Affairs, uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing by half. Um, to, to go back to the incremental nature of regulatory inform and improvement, probably unless there was um, a again a burning platform each of those little initiatives may not have been able to move at all to the legislative session because they're not meaty enough uh, 
the impact of cumulative uh, regulatory improvement is that we were able to take um, six or seven, maybe even 12 of those small little changes, put them in a package to uh, speed up the development uh, approval process by at least three months. So again, that's work of the incremental nature of regulation and how it really is in the weeds. Um, and you got to get, you got to roll up your sleeves and start digging in order to, to make those improvements. It's almost, you know, I, I have over the years always really enjoyed when I got to lead cross departmental work, right? Where everybody's coming to the table to create a large strategy, whether it's to tackle issues of domestic violence, economic development, whatever it might be. And everybody comes to the table with their solutions. I think it's interesting because what you're doing now is saying everybody needs to come to the table to remove some of those barriers. And it's not an ordinary lens to do that collaborative work and yet it gives it impetus it yeah. gives it focus um and it can drive more impact and so it, it is quite key and i think one of the great things about the office of the regulatory affairs and effectiveness and your team is you're becoming experts and the you are experts you were experts you're still experts but you also have a formula it is formulaic in nature as to how to do these things and so each line department doesn't have to necessarily yeah. create their plan. You can help them create the plan because you know how to create a plan that actually tackles and modernizes regulation. Yeah, I, and I, I, um, I, 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 so just to, to expand on that, we're currently working with, again, an area that um, our policy experts in the government know much more about but to your point we know we know where regulatory improvements can be made and we know how, how to make them um, again in line with another priority of government uh, improving the health care system we've set a burden uh, reduction target to remove or lighten the administrative burden of physicians by 50,000 hours per year the equivalent of 150 patient visits per year but again that's not work that we own it's work that seniors in long-term care owns department of health and wellness nova scotia health authority even workers compensation in iwk department of community uh, services we're working with those partners to identify areas where we can work with them and that looks uh different ways for different departments for the Nova Scotia Health Authority. They have a list of initiatives that they want to tackle. We can measure them for them. Uh, for other departments, um, we can work a lot alongside with them to make some form improvements. So that's another example of how we can collaborate with partners. And again, I'll just emphasize how fortunate we are to have such willing partners. Um, that health, uh, that physician administrative burden reduction work, I'll say is the first in the country. So talk about proud moments for Nova Scotia. This is another one where I think we're up there when it comes to ensuring we're uh, the leader of the pack when it comes to regulatory reform and excellence. And when we achieve the uh, target, and I have no doubt uh, with our partners that we will, um, we may just set another target because we can keep going. There's lots of there's lots of improvements that can be made and a lot of people that are willing to make them. For sure. Well, a big switch in terms of business focus to yeah. health and, um, you know, doctors um, time and how can we use their time more wisely. But again, pretty similar issue in terms of trying to figure out how do we use people's time most wisely to get the outcomes that we want. We want a safe and regulated environment. But we want people to not be overburdened by paperwork and, you know, things that that are a drain to time and, and negatively impacting them. So that's pretty that's very exciting. Uh, I want to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit. One of the um, suggestions that I had made, one of the recommendations was that we needed to consider alternatives to regulation. Um, and I just wonder, are we seeing any uh, attention being given to that? Because sometimes. Uh, regulation might not always be the way that we should tackle an issue. Maybe there are other approaches that we should take. Yeah, so um, in our business impact assessment, again, regulators would know this, we do have an area where we ask, um, were other options considered? And oftentimes, or most times, other options are considered. Sometimes regulation is the only way uh, a change will work. Um, 
sometimes, though, there are, as you say, other means to achieving something. So I know that education is a big one, just raising awareness. So in, in fact, I mean, one issue that we're working on now um, with, with, with physicians is can we reduce regulation, not by making any changes to legislation or policy or regulation, but by simply educating people um, around, uh, uh, for instance, scopes of practice, that there that you may not always need to see a physician because there are lots of other professionals that have a broader scope of practice. So again, that wouldn't require changing anything. It would, it would require just educating people. What about the, um, I mean, again, talking about the pandemic and the switch to a virtual world, the switch to e-signatures instead of wet signatures. I mean, think of the days where we, everybody had to go and you had to sign and, you know, new tools yeah. to be able to DocuSign and all of the things yeah. that have been developed. What about the uh, continuous improvement in terms of embracing technology, embracing yeah. new ways of doing things? I think yeah. sometimes citizens get frustrated with government because they say, listen, I can buy anything online, but I can't do things online. I can sign paperwork for my kids' summer camp, but you won't let me do paperwork to get into a program. So where do you see that going and where have we seen some improvements there? Yeah, so absolutely. During the pandemic, we, we saw a change to uh, in many areas, including electronic signature. Um, I'm going to be like uh, this. This may not be a popular view. While I completely agree that technology is a solution to many regulatory challenges, we have heard from businesses um, that it's not one size fit all and technology doesn't always work for the customer. So I'll give you a concrete some concrete examples. Um, our business navigators are old school. They pick up the phone, they talk to business clients, um, and oftentimes they're here, they, they'll hear on the other end of the phone, I just needed someone to talk to. My situation is unique. I tried going online, I tried filling things out, but it just doesn't work for me. The other thing that I'll say is, again, for those uh, that have worked with our office, we're very pragmatic and very practical. Uh, technology changes across government, Laurel, I'm sure you'll appreciate and others may appreciate, can be years in the making. And our office, again, just think of where we started. We had to show results in three years. We didn't have years to wait, uh, wait for a whole transformation of a, uh, of a techno technological solution or, or um uh, yeah, or process. So we absolutely agree that technology has a role to play. We are more focused on kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of regulation themselves. And then we'll let the folks that are experts in digitization do their thing. Are, how are the, um, because that was also another big thing during the pandemic that different provinces, we might have had our Atlantic bubble, but very different rules. And we yeah. continue to this day to have very different rules across Canada. And you might say, does it seem like a country with the different rules that we have? What are we seeing nationally with mm -hmm. respect to harmonization? And can you give us some perspective on Absolutely. what's happening there? Yeah, so our office um, sits on, or is Nova Scotia's representative on the regulatory reconciliation and cooperation table. Only us in government can create these titles, <laughs> Laura, I'll tell you. It's, uh, it was a table created under the Canada Free Trade Agreement to essentially harmonize or reconcile regulations across the country to, again, take advantage of the economic benefits that come from having a more aligned system so that a truck operating in one part of the province doesn't have to change its tires at the border when it moves somewhere else. So the uh, the RCT, it's called, has been in operation for five years. Nova Scotia chaired it uh, in its second year. And to date, we've um, uh, negotiated 11 reconciliation agreement in areas ranging from occupational health and safety to transportation to energy efficiency products to aquaculture site markings uh, and the construction code. All of those agreements to date are estimated to save uh, Canadian businesses that operate interprovincially at least a billion dollars. And that was work done by the National Research Council. Um, I will say the work, again, requires healthy doses of urgency and patience, negotiating with 14 parties um, on first aid kits or first aid kit contents is not for the faint of heart. Um, but again, it is the ultimate story of red tape that it really is the cumulative impact. So um, believe it or not, we do have now one standard for first aid kits and first aid kit contents and first aid training and safety boots and eye protection where before the RCT 
If you were to follow the rule of the law, you would have had to buy 14 pairs of safety glasses, 14 pairs of safety boots, which is not the way a country needs to operate, particularly in some of those uh, fundamental areas. So um, it is exciting work, but again, it's um, it has a little bit more, I would say it has more structure than the work in Atlantic Canada, which may be why we've surprisingly made a little bit more progress nationally uh, than we have uh, in the region. Yeah, again, an, an umbrella organization, yeah. a commitment that said yeah. we're doing this for a reason, and somebody that has to report on what did they get done yeah. to, to folks that wanted it to happen. I know we're just a couple of minutes away from uh, jumping into some of the questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask one more, one last question. When you were talking about, uh, you know, the 14 different pairs of glasses or the first aid kit, um, one of the things, one of the concepts that can really drive some change very hard is zero-based budgeting. Say, okay, justify everything from the ground up. We're not going to accept that things need to be the way they are. Um, is that concept starting at all in terms of regulatory reform to say, listen, we got to justify from the ground up. We don't just accept we need it because we need it. Yeah, interesting. So I don't know if there's zero based uh, regulatory budgeting, but there is regulatory budgeting. So there are some jurisdictions now that require departments every year to put forward a plan for how they're going to regulate, what they're going to regulate, and wh where are the areas that they are going to reduce regulation. And again, we have never had a deregulation mandate, no, not whatsoever. We want to make sure we do right regulation and right size regulation. And in some provinces, as I say, there is an expectation of every department that they'll that they'll they'll outline what their regulatory budget is for the year. That could be something that we could do here. Great. So now let's jump into some of the questions from the audience. So we have a question from Dan O'Connor. How has the office's work affected the drafting of new regulations and the analysis of proposed regulations uh, that is sent to cabinet? Does the office share lessons learned with the Office of Legislative Council or others with a significant role in legislative drafting? Great question. Yeah. Really great question. So through our business impact assessment, what happens is we work with, the, with, we work with the department as they put in their proposed changes to regulation. It could be new regulation or the removal of regulations or amending regulations, which includes legislation as well. The departments submit a business impact assessment to our office and our office does its own assessment. Uh, so putting on a best practice regulatory lens um, on the proposal. We send in our office's assessment independently from the sponsoring department. Um, sometimes we have a difference of view. We work very hard to be aligned because we don't want it to be, um, uh, there, we don't want there to be conflicting advice coming from within government. So, but, but sometimes we do have a little different advice. Um, so that's how our advice goes to cabinet. In terms of sharing our um, lessons learned with uh, the drafters, we really do focus on the policy side because the, the drafting itself is a product of the policy. So if you get the policy right, if the policy is light touch, um, then it's our view that, that the drafting will follow. So we haven't done that much work with those that draft. I mean, we do work a, lo a lot with justice lawyers, um, but not necessarily on the drafting of legislation, but it's a great idea. It could be something that we, we look at in the future. Great. Okay, another audience question. Um, I guess picking up on the conversation about a sunset. Do you anticipate a sunset for the office? Is there a work plan or timetable with a defined end uh, for the Office of Regulatory Affairs work? Uh, so when our legislation was introduced initially, we did have a three-year sunset, and it was a requirement that um, that a review be conducted and that it go to the House as to whether or not our office continues. Uh, we are very fortunate in that when that review was done and when it went to the House, there was all party support for our office to continue. So uh, right now there's no sense that we're part of government, we're institutionalized in government. And just like um, how the tax system or how the health system is in need of continual reform and evolution, we believe that the regulatory system kind of sits in that category as well. Yeah, and I would think that the nimbleness of the organization to go and tackle different areas, at some point you might say, well, we've we've tackled as much as we can in business, but now you're yeah. over in healthcare. Next thing we're yeah. gonna send you somewhere else. So I think there's always going to be work to do if you're if the you know office is open to tackle different types of work. 
Absolutely. I know one of the areas that I would love to get into is um, taking a look at the regulatory impact on vulnerable citizens. Uh, to me, again, this is such a great area of opportunity because there are probably fewer citizens that are most vulnerable that interact with government more often. So there has been research, again, that shows there is a disproportionate impact of regulatory burden, burden on our most vulnerable, and I would love to get in and tackle that. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of areas uh, where, where, where we could go. We're a really small office, so as I say, we try to pick our spots. Yeah, absolutely. I would think, um, you know, and that would come on both sides. That would come on the side of citizens who need to complete yep. paperwork to perhaps absolutely. get government support, um, you know, as a result of a, a disability. And, yep. but then the doctor needs to fill that out too. Yep. So if you really started looking at the burden of, you know, a line in a document that says, get this form filled out, absolutely. The cost of getting that form filled out would be pretty high, both on the individual and on the system. Absolutely. And I'll say that that focus has been validated in our work with physicians, because again, it's the most vulnerable that they see most often and they see the impact of having to get this form, having to get this yeah. form completed, having to go online to search up information. I mean, it is quite, um, it, again, it's an area of, of significant opportunity if, if, we're, if we were to look at reducing burden in a very targeted area. Yeah. Okay, another question. Um, what initiatives are in the hopper for 22-23 that you're excited about? Um, I would say the physician work. It's super, super exciting um, because it's an area where we can make a material and significant impact in the lives of physicians, but in the lives of their patients as well. Um, when we surveyed physicians and 500 physicians uh, completed the survey on physician administrative burden, they said that unnecessary administrative burden, so that's essentially forms that they need to complete, which are overly complex or duplicative processes that are very, um, again, complex and very uh, painstaking to complete. It impacts their work-life balance. It imp impacts their work environment. It impacts their productivity, and it makes them really tired. So giving some of that back to physicians um, and also freeing up a little bit more time so they can maybe spend a little bit more time with the patient or maybe take on a few more patients to me is so impactful. And I never thought I'd have the opportunity to do, the, to do this work. So I think that's an area of huge opportunity and that's what I'm most excited about. That's great, that's great. Um, the um, So it, just in terms of thinking about, um, you know, we're coming to the end of our time. So I, I just wanted to ask you, you've had an audience here of people who have given their time to us for an hour who care about this. I mean, what would be something that it would be critical for them to know and think about um, in their own daily work, whether they're working in the public service or whether they're in the private sector, just in terms of driving change and yeah. through regulation? Yeah, um, so I would say, uh, putting a lens on, on cumulative impact. So again, it may just be one form that you're adding or one more field on the form that you're adding and uh, really thinking the information that you would collect is really important. What we hear is it's that form and that department and this one in this department and that one and that one and that one and that one and it's the cumulative impact. I know it's really hard for folks that are working in a very specific area to try to broaden their view to see how this fits in with all the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, but that would be, I guess, my big advice. I would also say we're always here. We would love to help you in any way. Um, again, we have such amazing partners across government. We have a lot of uh, champions uh, within departments. So if there is any uh, questions folks may have or ideas they have, we're really here to help and support to make Nova Scotia Canada's leading uh, jurisdiction when it comes to regulatory excellence. All right, a great last question has come in um, from Paula Gallagher. Thinking about the future of regulatory reform five to 10 years from now, how will the world of regulation be different? Mm, well, in my perfect world, I would say um, just as there is a uh, uh, annual budget for taxation where we get to see and debate the benefit of this tax, that tax, we would have a regulatory budget and we would take what is currently opaque and give it some light. 
so that we could make really informed choices or that we knew um, the impact and the efficiency and efficacy of our regulatory system as we can judge or measure um, on, on the taxation side. I would also say technology is going to play a significant role um, in the regulatory environment, everything from maybe virtual inspections where you use a drone. Um, so I think technology is going to significantly reform um, our, our how we view regulation. Uh, I really do hope too that we take all of the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic and apply them moving forward, particularly when it comes to assessing risk. Um, because we found out, well, we learned during the pandemic that there was, I would, I would say, a higher threshold for taking a little bit of risk when it comes to um, regulatory requirements. And I would hope that all of those lessons can be carried forward. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, it's hard to see what may happen in five to 10 years. It's an excellent question. I'm going to give it some more thought, though, when this is done. No, the, but those are really great things. And I do think, again, shining some light on the importance of regulation, but the impact of regulation. So many times the solution of a stakeholder or somebody in community is, oh, you need to, reg government, you need to regulate this. Yeah, yeah. You need to regulate yeah. it, because there's another way we can do it because there is an impact to that. Yeah, uh, well, you know, well, actually, I might just add one thing. So one of the one of the things that we heard during the pandemic was um, departments really kept very close contact with their stakeholders. They had to talk to them every day because their business, like things were changing yeah. so quickly. So again, in five or 10 years, I would hope that we're actually developing regulation, regulatory solutions with stakeholders so that we close the gap between the regulator and the regulated. Great. Well, I know that our time is coming to an end and I'll just conclude by saying um, when I handed in the report uh, in 2014, Charting a Path for Growth, I hoped that the uh, recommendations would be uh, undertaken. Um, I hoped that things would happen, but I have to say, I don't know that I could foresee that we would be sitting here today and so much work would have been done and, you know, really the baton would have been taken and you guys would, would have run and run as far as you did. So congratulations and uh, thank you for what you're doing every day. Oh, thank you for the discussion. Thank you for the report. Thank you to everyone that's listening that has been a partner with our work. We really appreciate it. And I just, again, feel so privileged to have the role that I have in this government. I mean, it's 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 pretty awesome. Over to you, Jennifer. Great. Thank you both so much. It seems like uh, the conversation could go on for a, a long time. There's so much to the work that you're doing and, and it's and it's really important work. So thank you both, Leanne and Laurel, for your insights and your experience on the topic of regulation, which at the surface uh, sounds differently than what it is. And uh, it sounds like there's really important work uh, ahead with this office, especially given some of the things that you've talked about, like the pandemic recovery and advancing the, redu the reduction of administrative burden in healthcare and vulnerable citizens, hopefully. So perhaps we can check in again in a couple of years, maybe to see how things have gone and how things have advanced. As a small token of our appreciation um, from the IPAC Nova Scotia Board, we'll be sending you both a coveted IPAC mug uh, to thank you for today. Um, and uh, a big thank you to everyone who joined us. We uh, want to encourage you to become a member of IPAC Nova Scotia, obviously. We have a great meeting ahead next week. Um, that we, uh, we hope you'll sign up for. It's an exciting presentation on climate change in Nova Scotia and what the projections are telling us. So next Wednesday, May 25th, please tune in for that. And thanks everyone for your attention and your participation. Thank you again to Leanne and Laurel. Um, it was a really riveting discussion. We look forward to seeing everybody next at next week's meeting. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.